YouTube, today we're gonna to show you three watches and each one of those watches is over a million dollars. Barstool Philadelphia, named Mike Tafuri. Charles also, go, also goes by Mike News underscore media on Instagram. Thank you guys for all the effort and hard work that goes into every video you guys put out. I can't begin to explain just how much entertainment and info I've gained from your channel. Over the past few years, just wanted to send a little something to show my gratitude. Although I already promised Kev the sale on my first LB watch. I look forward to meeting all of you guys one day. Thank you for all that you do. What does that say? Some books, some stuff like that, some t-shirts. And when he said helmets, I was expecting helmets. This is the helmets. But Mike, thank you so much for that. Let's get into the unboxing. Before we get into the million dollar watches, and there are three of them, there are three of them in this unboxing. I'm gonna go through a few light things in here. Sky Dweller, right? All, everyone that wanted a Sky Dweller, uh, basically over the last, I guess, good year and a half, mm -hmm. going back about six months, three months, you know, you were paying pretty ridiculous premiums. These have finally come down to a point where you're picking them up at around that retail price tag. Yep. Personally, the rose gold with, what is this dial? This is, Alec, what is this dial? The lighter. Uh, Sundust. Uh, Sundust. Sundust. Sundust, that's it. So the Sundust, Sundust dial on this, this combo with rose gold is absolutely love. My other favorite from Sky Dweller would be the yellow gold with the champagne dial or the gold dial as I like to call it. Just a good looking watch. As close to an AP brick as you can get from Rolex, right? It's just like a solid hunk of gold. Not even close, but <laughs> uh, I don't know what this is, but it looks like my favorite brand, Audemars Piguet, the rose gold offshore ceramic bezel. Somebody put this on a, thought it was a good idea to put this on a hornback brown strap. I personally don't think it's a good idea. Oh, this is original AP, oh no. Yeah, it doesn't. No, it's not. No, it's, it's not. It's not, this, yeah. is, this is a custom strap, looks like. Maybe it's from my friend Aaron Bespoke, I wouldn't be surprised. Shout out to Aaron, made a sick strap for for me, definitely a better fit on the black rubber strap, which is probably what we're gonna put on this watch. But nevertheless, again, a lot of value, a lot of bang for your dollars, sort of like the Sky Dweller that we just showed, where you can pick these up on a secondary market for a reasonable price, a big ass gold AP yep. at a price that, you know, there's some steel stuff is trading out there. For that and point. also the practicality of a ceramic bezel, you can wear it, knock it around, and won't get, you know, all, all kind of beat up like a So a the whole thing about ceramic is, they always talked about the ceramic was the answer to those you know, pesky little hairline scratches on um, your watches, right? There's an IWC in here. Hold on a second. Yeah. Oh, that, would explain, that yeah. would explain the strap that's here. Which has one of the worst boxes, by the way. These yeah. boxes yeah, peel these like boxes. crazy. They, they do peel like crazy. Somebody asked me and said, hey, I think it was about this watch, actually. Not that I think this it, watch is so nice, by the way. I love these three subdials with the three planets. It's I think this is the exact watch. So the guy DMs me says, I know this is a little bit below your pay grade, but I have a question for you. I'm looking to at an Omega, some sort of speedy, and I think it may have been this one, uh, to my collection, you know, sub 10,000, whatever it is, and I said, mm -hmm. absolutely, and A, this is not below my pay I'm a huge fan of the Omega. Anything Omega that has to do with space, I am a humongous fan. Hey, Nick, which one is this? From the moon to Mars. From the moon to Mars. Thank you, Nick, our, our in-house Omega specialist. You didn't even know what this was. Uh, we get these every so often. Again, Something contra like. contra contra contrary to all belief, the 5990 rose gold at the height. I mean, when they first came out, people were asking like 450. I don't think. Oh, they were over 500 at one point. But nobody actually bought yeah. them over 500. I think I think a steady price in the hot market on these were around that 350 mark. That's what yeah. they were actually selling for. We've never sold one higher than 350, and around and we were selling them at around the 350 range. I felt they were already overpriced, and we were selling them mostly B2B. Uh, and now they've sort of stabilized in that $250,000 price range, which is still 2X retail, more, a little more than 2X retail. Yeah. And again, what's not to like? I mean, the blue dial contrasting against the rose gold. Again, I'm more of a fan of a black dial against rose gold, but this dark blue works just the same. Yeah. What I would love to see from this watch is I would love to see this with a rose dial. Just like the old gold. Think of a ladies Nautilus. I mean, I'd even love to see like a black, gray, like the 5980 uh, in rose gold, like that kind of hue of dial. But again, it might be a little bit too similar. I think that's why they picked blue, right? Because it would be a point of difference. Well, blue is hot. You know, the blue ones are the more collectible ones yeah. across a lot of other brands. You know what I would like to see actually? I would like to see a rose gold and green, like a dark green. 
but it'll blend in. If you look, if you think of the green on the 5711 and steel that they did, yeah. you can, unless you come up close, like, you, I'm can't thinking, even, you can't so, even tell. You know the, the 5205R? They okay. just did it with that green kind of fume right. vignette dial. Like something like that in there would be sick. Or like the World Time with the green dial. Yes. Or the 59, uh, 5270 yeah. with the green dial, yeah. which I yeah. was a big fan of. By I think the way. that would be so Let's sick. Let's get into a couple of special pieces. And by special pieces, I mean, they're both rare. They're, they're, uh, they're all rare. They're all super expensive. They're all made in extremely small production and they're all that you certainly begin to see on a daily basis and at the same token uh, certainly not together in one bunch yeah right no. I'm gonna give you the 5208 Patek Philippe this is a full-blown perpetual calendar automatic mono pusher yeah. chronograph so the complications in here are insane Patek Philippe tends to put their annual calendars up into their grand complication line yep. well to me this is a grand complication annual calendar not so much but this actually justifies the name Grand Complication. Yeah. If I'm going to let Marco geek out on the movement and, and all it does and how complicated it is to make one of these. Yeah, I mean, how, how many are they making? Uh, Maybe, he's like stuttering. <laughs> yeah, how many are they making of these? Maybe a handful a year in terms of for, to make a mono pusher chronograph, a perpetual calendar together, and then add a mini repeater to that and then make it fully automatic. I mean, when Patek is described as the king of complication, I think this pretty much is emblematic of exactly that. I mean, it's because, only missing a turbine. That's yeah, about it. Th that's literally the only complication that can make it more complicated. So, like, the, the watch itself is nothing short of a masterpiece. I mean, there's not much to say other than it's it's incredible. So this is the 5208. If you go back to some of the older uh, variations of uh, perpetual uh, mini repeaters at 5074, they were much smaller. The fact that they've outlined some of the windows for the perpetual calendar and some of the uh, chronograph counts, they sort of outlined it with sort of these gold, uh, I guess, borders, whatever you want yeah. to call them, right? Just everything about this aesthetically is a good looking watch because historically, and I've sold quite a few uh, paddock complications or grand complications in my past. And honestly, I think this is one of the best looking ones thus far. Again, I'm not going to get into the skeleton mini repeaters because it's a different watch and market price on this watch is hovering around that one and a half million dollar price range if you can get your hands on one application piece so, uh, i mean it's a watch you're going to have to have extensive purchase history you're going to have to be familiar uh, you can't well, just first walk, of all, you, yeah. you, in order to get yeah. something like this you're going through an interview process yeah. you have having dinner with stern himself it's a whole process you're probably waiting two to three years before you're able to actually get the physical watch that will make that allocate that watch for you and then go and make it but before they allocate that watch for you you probably have to have at a minimum if i had to guess a five million plus spend with the tech yeah. before you get into a range such as this i'm going to go to my favorite brand and you may have seen some reels that are already made courtesy of kyle back there <laughs> This is near and dear to my heart. It's the Audemars Piguet Double Balance. And it's not just any Double Balance, this is their, I'd like to call this their fuck you Double Balance, right? <laughs> so you're all familiar with the Audemars Piguet Double Balance, the 41 millimeter. And Audemars Piguet once in a while likes to flex its uh, muscles, not just in regards to horology, although horologically this Double Balance, if you want to get into that really quick. Yeah, it's it's huge. So the, the original was the 15305. Now that was a very like industrial looking watch, but they actually improved it tremendously. So it's 30% more accurate by uh, adding a Double Balance wheel, right? So it just is a testament to Audemars Piguet's uh, improvements in terms of watchmaking, right? They are focused on it, but they just use the Royal, Royal Oak silhouette which is so nice. And, and, and it makes people not appreciate AP for their watchmaking quite enough because of it. No, I mean, listen, Audemars Piguet in its roots started making complicated watches. They didn't start by making a yeah. one time only watch. They, they, they did uh, 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 complicated movements for Tiffany & Co and their pocket watches in the likes of perpetual calendars and things of that nature. What they've done here is then they've taken an existing horological ma masterpiece and they made it into a jewelry masterpiece. And by making it a jewelry masterpiece, they literally took the entire watch and baguetted it out, if that's yeah. even a terminology. I think, I think right. they call this a chandelier. Well, well this is the real chandelier. <laughs> yeah. This is not a DJ Khaled chandelier. Yeah. This is a real deal chandelier, a watch that trades also for a million and a half on the market. That's what its retail price is. I think a million five and change Swiss francs. And this is where they trade. 
Uh, again, maybe one or two of these were produced a year, specially allocated pieces either to uh, a big door from AP or a retail client. The, different, the key difference you're gonna find is obviously the weight because this is made in white gold. Setting diamonds in a precious metal is much easier. Uh, the setting on the stones themselves is absolutely amazing. It, it almost is seamless. And the real test, which you guys can't really see, is when you touch it, if it doesn't catch, that's how you know it's just perfectly flawlessly set diamonds. Each one of these diamonds is hand-picked. They're put into what's what we call in the jewelry industry a collection to where each diamond matches size-wise, clarity-wise, everything has to match up so that if I were to pull every one of these diamonds and lay them out on the table in a white piece of paper, you'll see that they're all perfectly look like each other, which you consider the fact there's no diamond out there is like the other is a very hard task to begin with. And the other key difference is, you know, is the bracelet is slightly thicker, again, to allow for the setting of the diamonds. Last but not least is a watch that I actually thought long and hard about showing and not showing. Normally, this is a watch I would never show to the world because of how rare something is. I'll tell you guys a story. <laughs> uh, I managed to get my hands on a watch about which a book was written. In 1976, Nautilus was created by Gerald Genter. That he created, obviously, the Royal Oak, the Nautilus, the Ingenieur, and yeah. Laureate, and so on and so on and so forth, right? Nautilus was one of the things he created because uh, the family was into uh, <clears throat> nautical things and it was inspired by a porthole of a ship, right? The 3700 was the first watch. They made it in stainless steel, they made it in gold. They made it in white gold, they made it in two-tone. You guys seen us from time to time show you pieces uh, that belong to the Sultan of Oman, who was technically his own dealer. He yeah. basically ordered things directly from Paddock, but he also worked very closely with Asprey of London. And what Asprey of London did alongside with Paddock is they would put the conjure, that a terminology that a lot of watch guys out there know, they would put a conjure on the watch somewhere, be it the dial, be it whatever. So what I have had the pleasure of having is actually this particular watch, which was a white gold version with the Conjure logo on it. This watch has long been sold. It's sold for a pretty ridiculous amount of money. And the reason for that is because there's only three of them in the world. At the time we had this, one was in the Museum in Amman, the other one was with a collector in Germany who's got more money than Germany, and the third one was with us, and then we sold it off to a collector. What we have here, and this box is also very important, is we have the yellow gold version of that very watch with the same Conjure logo, of which they only made 12 in the world. The whereabouts of the other 11s, I don't know. Uh, I do know that we have one of the 12 in absolute pristine mint condition, and I'm gonna get to the box later, but here's the Conjure logo, 3700 in yellow gold. It's uber mint because it came back from paddock service, and especially due to this box. You would think, wait a minute, Roman, what's so special about this box? What happened to the cork box that the 3700 came in? And well, this is much rarer. The reason for that is because this was a box that was issued by Asprey of London with a Conjure logo. And more importantly, the way you know this is the right box is if you zoom in here, it would actually have their address in Geneva. The only place this was done was at the Asprey Boutique in Geneva back in the late 70s, early 80s. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is probably one of, this is top 10 rarest watches along with this guy. So in my hands, the white gold and the yellow gold is probably top 10 rarest watches I've ever had in my 20 year career. I'll bring it to you live. There you have it, 3,700 Conjure. Marcus seemed to be speechless. Yeah, I'm kind of speechless. I mean, for the first two were, were pretty crazy and then the, the third one is, is, I mean, that's absolutely crazy. To hold something or see something that there are literally 10 to 12 of. It's exactly 12. I, I mean, exactly 12 it is insane. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. YouTube, don't forget, like, comment, share, subscribe. Thank you, Facebook. Thank you, Instagram. We'll see you on the next one.